noonday, good afternoon, and welcome to today's webinar, Elegant Arbitration, Designing a Cost-Effective and Timely Arbitration Process. This webinar is brought to you by Upchurch Watson White and Max Mediation Group uh, in cooperation with the University, University of Florida College of Law Institute for Dispute Resolution, and we are certainly proud to be co-sponsors uh, with the University of Florida. Uh, I am Jeff Fleming, and I will introduce our presenters. Uh, on the, the line with us today is also uh, Larry Watson, Lawrence M. Watson, Jr. Uh, Larry is a founding partner of Upchurch Watson White and Max. Uh, he had an active litigation practice from 1969 to 1997 and became president of the Florida Bar Trial Lawyer Section. In 1987, he began a mediation practice and chaired the Florida Supreme Court Standing Committee on Mediation Arbitration Rules and Procedures for 12 years and led the development of Florida's rules for certified and court-appointed mediators. He received the Florida Academy of Professional Mediators Award of Merit in 2000, the Amer American College of Civil Trial Mediators Lifetime Achievement Award in 2005, and the Sharon Press Excellence in ADR Award from the Florida Dispute Resolution Center in 2015. So hello, Larry. Hello. Uh, we, we also have with us uh, Michelle Jernigan. Uh, uh, Michelle has been a member of the Florida Bar for over 37 years and a member of Upchurch Watson White and Max for 27 years and a shareholder since 2000. She is one of uh, the very first mediators to become Florida Supreme Court certified in 1988 and has mediated thousands of disputes uh, so far. Uh, she became a qualified arbitrator in 1992 and has served as a sole arbitrator on employment cases, consumer a consumer case, and on hundreds of uh, paper-only arbitrations. She's also served on a panel of arbitrators for the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority. Some of you know that as FINRA. Uh, in 37 cases and is currently serving on a panel for seven FINRA cases. Uh, she's also served as a panel member on a non-binding arbitration involving construction claims and non-residential owners association claims. And she's currently serving on a panel of arbitrators on a medical malpractice and an employment case. Uh, and I'm Jeff Fleming. Uh, I am also a Florida Supreme Court qualified arbitrator. I'm a board certified civil trial lawyer. Uh, in fact, I served as the uh, chair of the Florida Bar Civil Trial Certification Committee. Uh, I am a former Orange County judge and uh, Ninth Circuit judge. And for those of you not terribly familiar with Florida, uh, that's Orlando, uh, also known as Disney World in some parts of the country. Um, but I was a county judge, circuit judge, and also served as a on a visiting or associate judge basis on the Fifth District Court of Appeal. Uh, more importantly than all that, I am also a shareholder of Upchurch Watson White and Max. Uh, I'm a mediator, arbitrator, uh, fellow of the Academy of Court Appointed Masters, so I also do special magistrate work. Uh, and having served in the domestic division when I was on the bench, I uh, still do those uh, mediations and also uh, work as a guardian ad litem, both on a paid and voluntary basis. So uh, I would describe my practice uh, as a very broad based. Uh, from a substantive uh, standpoint. I've worked primarily as a sole uh, arbitrator and I, I also am familiar with the uh, AAA platform. All right, so those are your uh, presenters. And now we proudly present Elegant Arbit Arbitration, designing a cost-effective and timely arbitration process. And to lead us off is Larry Watson. Larry? Yeah, we get a lot of questions on uh, comparing arbitration to litigation and the benefits of one over the other. I think it might help to start with sort of an overview of alternative dispute resolution systems in general. If you if you put them on a spectrum, starting on one side, you have systems with full party control and the spectrum gradually moves to the other side where you have systems with no party control. Um, we start with negotiation. The parties are in full control. They can say what they want to say, when they want to say it. They get together, they hammer out a deal. No time limits, no restraints, no restrictions. We then sort of move a little bit to facilitated negotiation, where we bring in a mediator, uh, an adult in the room, if you will, who uh, puts a little process control on it, but the parties basically still make their own decisions, so still fully consensual. 
the spectrum moves on, we get to a midpoint and a line gets crossed where we go from party control to adjudicated systems where now there's going to be a third party entering to make the decision. Arbitration falls on the first of those adjudicated systems. The, the decision, the outcome is resolved by a third party in arbitration panel, but the process is still in control of the parties. They can define the arbitrator, they can define the process they're going to use to get to a judgment. And then of course you move on past that to the litigation where there is virtually no party control. Uh, the rules of procedures spell how, when, and where you're going to argue. The rules of evidence define what you're going to present. And then the, uh, the judge or the jury decides what, what the outcome will be. Uh, the parties are given some control over the pen they want to use to write the check they're going to use to pay for it all. But beyond that, sit where you're told to sit, say what you're told to say, when we tell you to say it, and, and wear a nice clean shirt. So getting back though on arbitration, the, the, the difference between arbitration and, and, and litigation is that the parties still maintain process control in arbitration. And that's kind of what we're all about in this program. Uh, exercising intelligent uh, process control. The main benefits to arbitration is, of course, you can control the confidentiality, the privacy, you can keep it, keep it all quiet, you can pick your own neutral to make the decision for you, you can define your own rules and procedures that are tailored to your dispute, and, and at the same time, working well, you can provide an informed, just, and a commercially reasonable resolution of the dispute. Arbitration was originally conceived by guilds and trade groups to internally resolve commercial disputes. And it was the commercial side, the mercantile side that, that gave birth to the movement. It's now widespread over many disputes. The overall objective was to be less costly and quicker than litigation. Uh, unfortunately, in many cases, that's not working out so good right now. Uh, we still, present-day arbitration tend to get bogged down in process debate in, in uh, too much material, too many evidential submissions, no controls over the procedural disputes. And in many instances, the process isn't less costly and quicker uh, than it should be. And that's why we try to make it elegant. Uh, what we seek to do uh, through a, a facilitated process control of the, of the arbitration procedure is to create a, a smooth, uh, concise, and, and directed um, uh, process so that the goal is we have greater efficiency. We, we, we design a system that's cost effective without wasted time or money. We design a system that's timely, prompt resolution, that's fair, equitable hearing of all sides to the issue. There's no wasted time. And all of this requires strong process management and a lot of planning. In fact, the more we plan, the more elegant and the more spontaneous we become. Uh, we regard that planning function as a duty of the arbitrator. Uh, rule, uh, AAA rule 32B says the arbitrator shall conduct the arbitration proceedings with a view to expedite resolution. And that's what this program is about, uh, planning and elegant arbitration. So. That's the setup now, Michelle. We start at the beginning. What's the first thing we got to be looking at? So I like to focus on um, the title of this slide, which I think is very telltale. You know, arbitration really is a creature of contract, so it can essentially be what the parties design it to be. Now, in most situations, you will encounter a client who's already executed an arbitration contract or a provision, there'll be a provision, an arbitration provision in the contract that they've executed. So in some respects, you may not have as much control over what that looks like, what that process looks like, although you can address some of those issues at an initial case management conference where you can reach agreement on how you're going to do certain things. But you have an ideal opportunity to create a contract that best fits the needs of the parties to, in essence, create an arbitration that's going to be best suited for your particular type of dispute. And um, 
one of the things that you should do is consider a number of major considerations. And one is the types of disputes that are going to be governed by the court system and those that will be governed by the arbitration. It's very important to specify in the contract how that is going to be determined. You should have a provision in there that discusses the types of rules that you would choose to employ, whether it would be federal rules of civil procedure, Florida rules of civil procedure. Perhaps you want to look at some of the rules of procedures that have been set forth by AAA, that's American Arbitration Association. There's other arbitration providers and they have rules that they publish online. You could certainly borrow from some of those if you wanted to. You need to consider how heavy are the rules of evidence going to play a role in your particular dispute. Most of the time in arbitrations, the arbitrators are going to very loosely apply the rules of evidence and you might want to consider uh, specifying something about that in your contract. You also want to talk a little bit about the type of discovery that will be utilized in your process. Are you going to limit it? And I think among Jeff and Larry and I, we think that it probably should be somewhat limited because if it isn't limited, it really does take away from the elegance of the arbitration process. You should also define the process for selecting the arbitrators. And uh, you need to consider, are you going to have a sole arbitrator? Are you going to have a panel? What type of background are these folks going to have? Are you going to select from a particular arbitration provider? Or are you going to select from just a broad range of folks? You need to consider as well which law applies. If you, if you don't indicate what law applies, then obviously um, you can explore later down the road and determine what law applies. But in essence, there's really three possibilities in Florida. It would be the FAA, which is the Florida Arbitration Act, and that's probably the one that would be most commonly applicable because most disputes involve some interstate commerce. But we also have the revised Florida Arbitration Code, which almost mirrors the, the FAA, and certainly you could decide that that dispute is going to govern. And, or I'm sorry, that that law would govern your arbitration. And then another act that's somewhat new, and quite frankly, I'm really not all that familiar with it, is the Florida International Commercial Arbitration Act, which this particular presentation doesn't give us sufficient time to talk about that, but it basically governs international arbitrations that would take place within the state of Florida. So now we're going to have Jeff talk to you a little bit about arbitrator selection. Okay, thanks, Michelle. So the dictionary defines an arbitrator as a person chosen to decide a dispute or settle differences, especially one formally empowered to examine, examine facts and decide the issue. So um, in considering the different qualities that you want to consider in an arbitrator, it seems to me that impartiality is first and foremost. Um, and in fact, you could say that the other qualities don't really matter uh, if the arbitrator is biased. Now, I think Larry's gonna discuss a little later non-neutral arbitrators, but generally speaking, uh, in selecting an arbitrator, you, you are selecting someone who will be neutral. Uh, and I can tell you from my background as a judge that um, exercising impartiality uh, is a skill in itself. Uh, and I'm not suggesting that only former judges make good arbitrators, but uh, I do think in selecting an arbitrator, um, considering someone that has a strong background in working as a neutral, what we call a neutral, uh, is something that you should consider, uh, whether that be a mediator or a special magistrate or, or otherwise, because 
um, there's there's a certain skill to that. And I can tell you, having been a judge and then going back into private practice, um, being an advocate and, and acting in a neutral capacity are two very different things. So uh, even though someone may have good intentions on being impartial, um, if their background uh, is such that it might you might perceive a bias, um, you know, that is something to be concerned about. Uh, I know we had a question about that. Um, you know, should mediators be required to list their specialty, uh, such as construction litigation? Now, this was referencing mediators, but the same question would apply to arbitrators. Uh, I certainly think that uh, when, first of all, an arbitrator should make a full disclosure in writing of all relationships to the parties, uh, any witnesses that have been disclosed um, to the attorneys, uh, and if their practice, their prior practice as an advocate was strongly uh, in the subject area, and especially if it was particularly on one side versus the other, plaintiff versus defense, that is something that I, I do think that sh uh, should be disclosed. So, uh, in, and you know, this is a, a question you'll have to resolve on a case by case basis. That is, the extent to which subject matter expertise is going to outweigh some of the other qualities you may be looking for in an arbitrator, uh, because there certainly are cases, and, and again, I know drawing on my experience as a former judge, there's certainly some areas of the, of the law uh, that are very specific, and uh, generally speaking, unless you practice in that area, you're not particularly competent to address it. So I, I recognize that, that there are situations where subject matter expertise would be a main consideration, uh, but, um, but you should certainly insist on a full disclosure to make sure that uh, that arbitrator uh, can also be impartial. You know, close behind uh, impartiality in, in terms of importance is what I would call procedural experience. Uh, again, uh, this is sort of a non-substantive uh, procedural ability to run things in a timely and orderly fashion. Uh, again, I think someone who's had experience working in a neutral capacity uh, is more likely to have that. Uh, and so that's something that you should uh, consider as well. And, and obviously the person's background, the number of arbitrations they've done before and, and what have you will, uh, will be informative uh, about their ability to, to run things. Uh, but also uh, how available uh, is the person you're considering uh, or in the case of a panel persons, uh, you know, if they're not available, if they can't timely get to things, uh, then you can't have an elegant arbitration. Um, and it, I, I would just say that that, to me, is the biggest consideration uh, in terms of getting things done efficiently is do you have an arbitrator uh, who has the time and who by nature is diligent enough that they will timely uh, respond to um, issues, if there are hearings, uh, that orders uh, following the hearings are generated, that emails are generated quickly, all of that has to do with availability uh, and diligence. So those are some considerations in selecting the arbitrator. Again, impartiality, uh, procedural experience, availability and diligence, and subject matter expertise. But an o what I would call an overarching concept is um, reputation. Uh, because if you have an arbitrator who has a reputation for these things, these qualities, then that arbitrator will have, will be respected and the parties are more likely um, to adhere to the, to the case management order and cooperate with the process. So, uh, you know, to some extent, um, the uh, profile of the arbitrator, I, I do think is important. Uh, and, and in that regard, I also think it's very important that although arbitrations are by nature somewhat less formal than uh, court proceedings, uh, I, I certainly like to um, engender an atmosphere of, of, of an air of formality. I, I think that that uh, promotes, again, respect for the process. Uh, and respect for the order. So again, I think the overall reputation uh, of the person that you are considering is is also extremely uh, important. So, and there there was a, a question, another question about how do you limit arbitrator personal bias? Uh, getting back to the impartiality uh, question, uh, it, you know, if the arbitrator is not making a written disclosure, uh, then you have uh, every uh, right to request that and to question it. 
nobody wants to uh, spend time and money uh, in an arbitration and then learn down the road that there's some relationship uh, that the arbitrator has that, that calls into question his or her impartiality. That's really on the arbitrator to initiate that, to make those disclosures, but if he or she hasn't, then by all means, uh, you should request that. So those are my, my thoughts on selecting the arbitrator, and uh, Michelle will now discuss the use of a sole arbitrator compared with a panel of arbitrators. Thanks. Jeff, and I really appreciate your emphasis on impartiality, and that's in essence a skill that most professional neutrals possess, because I think we oftentimes as lawyers gravitate towards subject matter expertise. We, we often think that if someone has the appropriate subject matter expertise, they would make a good person to be an arbitrator, but that's not necessarily the case because as you mentioned, impartiality, reputation are so important and they, then the ability to, to, um, to be, to exercise good procedural control and run things in an orderly fashion is so critical for purposes of an elegant arbitration. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the selection of a sole arbitrator. And among this group of presenters, we have developed somewhat of a rule of thumb um, because cost is a significant issue in making this determination. You know, if you are paying an arbitrator five or six hundred dollars an hour, let's just say five hundred an hour for ease of calculation, and you've got a panel of three, that arbitration is in essence costing your client fifteen hundred dollars an hour, and that doesn't even include the legal fees and costs that you're incurring on their behalf. So you can see how those dollars can add up very quickly. So we have this little rule of thumb that if you have a dispute of one million or less, it's probably more appropriate for one arbitrator. Um, the world, as you know, has become a very complex, case, complex world and litigation has become more complex. You know, 20, 30 years ago when Jeff and Larry and I were working, folks did not have such a thing as e-discovery. Well, now we do. And I have noticed that significantly complicates cases. And so as the world has become more complex, as technology has interwoven every aspect and area of our lives, as we have e-discovery, um, you know, disputes often become more complex. And so I like the triple A suggestion, and that's American Arbitration As Association commercial rules. They give us a little guidance in this area, and they basically say that when parties cannot agree on the number of arbitrators and a dispute involves over a million, um, they have a particular section for large and complex cases, and there's a rule in there called L2, or labeled L2, and that rule in essence says, when the parties can't agree on the number and the dispute is over a million, then use a three-person panel. And I think that's probably a good rule of thumb as well. So one of the other considerations too, and, and I really experienced this firsthand on a construction, uh, arbitration that I was involved in within the last couple of years and I served on a panel. In fact, it was a non-binding arbitration, but I noticed as a result of being with a panel, there's not much that you miss. So everybody's hearing the same evidence. You have the opportunity to discuss and interpret that evidence in connection with another arbitrator. And then of course you have the opportunity to, to discuss the application of legal principles. And that deliberation and discussion among a panel is really very valuable. So in essence, you've got, you've got the benefit of three minds instead of one. So I think that that is certainly one of the advantages of having a panel. So let's look at some of the other advantages and of course look at some of the disadvantages as well. So I think that we as lawyers often think of lawyers as arbitrators, but that's not necessarily the case. Um, recently I encountered a lady who is a managing member of a um, 
real estate syndicate and I was just talking about what I did for a living and she said, oh, you do arbitration. I said, yes. And she said, well, I'm in an arbitration right now. And I said, really? So we started talking about, you know, a little bit about her arbitration. And she told me that she had a panel and um, I thought it was very interesting that the chair of their panel was a CFO and somebody, a former CFO, and someone who actually had experience in her particular industry. So that person was not a lawyer, um, not a retired judge. So I thought that was kind of interesting because, you know, obviously you can be a little bit more creative with who you select as your arbitrator or as your panel. So um, some of the advantages again of having a panel like we talked about earlier you've got more folks and more minds to produce a written award and obviously the advantages or the disadvantages are expense and scheduling is a big disadvantage in my opinion because you've already got to schedule things around the parties and the attorneys and then if you have to take into account three busy arbitrator schedules, it can make scheduling quite difficult and can, can potentially delay arbitration proceedings. The other thing is I think it can take longer. Hearing times can be a little bit longer because arbitrators are by their very nature are curious and because the arbitration process is somewhat informal, unlike a little bit, you know, unlike the judicial process, the arbitrators are going to pipe in and ask specific questions of witnesses and um, sometimes you'll have all three of the arbitrators asking questions. So it can take a little bit longer as a result. So let's talk a little bit more about that selection of the one arbitrator. And I'm going to talk about selection of the sole arbitrator and then Larry's going to talk to us in a couple of minutes about different ways that you might utilize to select a panel. So you could select an arbitrator from really any source. It could be from the lawyers that you know. It could be from retired judges. It could be a specialist in a particular area of the law. It could be like the young lady that I spoke with, a specialist in a particular industry. Um, it could be a dispute resolution professional, somewhat like Jeff alluded to, that being an impartial and being a professional neutral is a very important quality for your arbitrator to have. And you could also reach out to various arbitration providers and utilize their list as a basis from which to select a sole arbitrator. And you could even, if the parties can't agree, although this would not necessarily be my recommendation, you could even have the provider make a selection if the parties were not in a position to make that selection themselves. So Larry, tell us a little bit more about selecting the three-person arbitration panel. Well, yeah, the three arbitrator panels, there are three options basically for selecting your panel of three. Uh, first option, you go to a provider, you get uh, the provider to pick them for you. So you basically go to AAA or CPR and say, we need three arbitrators. Uh, here's the case. They do a conflict check and send you the names of the three arbitrators. Very little input, very little control. Uh, the other option, second option, is um, uh, to get a list of potential uh, arbitrators from the uh, the panel and then choose from that list. You've, your universe of arbitrators to, to choose from is defined by the by the providers list uh, and, and then you work out a way where you pick one, I pick one, they'll pick another one or whatever, but you're working from a, a, a provider list that's been provided. Uh, then the third process is one where uh, the parties each select their own on a free choice basis and then commission the two selected arbitrators to choose the third. This is called the um, uh, party selected arbitration process and this is where problems can arise. Party selected arbitrators are supposed to be neutral 
and impartial. That's the default assumption. So I pick a neutral, you pick a neutral, and the two of them to get together and pick the third neutral. Unfortunately, that's not the way it always works out. Um, and you end up covertly getting uh, a, a arbitration panelist who's going to be kind of leaning toward the party that selected them. Uh, the uh, AAA has a rule, 13B, that says if you want to, and if you agree in writing up front, you can select arbitrators that are acknowledged to be non-neutral, i.e. party advocates. And under AAA R18B, there is a definition of a party advocate, and they that's a process, though, that everyone needs to know up front and everyone needs to sign on to in writing. Um, but I think that's kind of a bad choice, even if it is intended. Uh, I, I don't really like party advocate arbitrators. And one of the biggest issues I find with it is even when party advocate arbitration panelists are allowed, they can create a potential for evident partiality, which is a basis for vacating the award. I have seen party advocate advocators acknowledged and unacknowledged that simply carry it too far. They conduct ex party communications with their selection party about who the third party will be. Uh, I've seen them assist in the preparation of the party's case and, and, uh, and, and engage in rather intense advocacy uh, during the panel deliberations. Um, in the trade and the business, these, these uh, party advocate arbitration panelists are becoming more and more disfavored. Uh, just give me three good neutrals, however we get them, and, and uh, let's present the whole case uh, to, to, the, to, to three neutrals rather than two advocates and someone that's going to be pulled and pushed from the middle. Um, all the benefits that Michelle mentioned about having a three uh, panel, a three arbitrator panel with more eyes to look at the issues, more more minds to consider the the, the problems, more more input on the award, are kind of lost if you have two advocates in a in a neutral. Uh, it's also important to sort of control who the neutral, who the third party is going to be, because often the third selected arbitrator will be serving as the chair, and as we're going to see later, uh, a lot of the process control for the arbitration proceeding usually or can uh, reside in the chair. So, Jeff, we've uh, now picked the panel and sort of set the stage. Uh, what's the next step we head toward on a designing an elegant arbitration? Well, the next step is to conduct a case management conference, and the purpose of that is to enter a case management order. Uh, and my experience is that the sooner the better, uh, so usually that case management conference is by telephone, uh, but it's better if you can do it in person. Uh, but again, I think the timing will, will usually require it to be by phone. Uh, I know my personal preference in arbitrations is that, that before the case actually goes uh, to a final hearing, I like to have at least one in-person status conference. Uh, I think that's uh, uh, promotes a resolution of issues and uh, just in terms of addressing housekeeping issues and what have you, uh, I, I find that to be very productive. Uh, but in terms of the case management conference and, and the um, subsequent order, uh, it's usually uh, sooner uh, than, than later is the best approach. Uh, now, before that case management conference, uh, I'd like to obtain from counsel any prior pleadings, uh, motions, demands for arbitration, uh, responses, uh, our operative arbitration clauses, agreements to arbitrate, um, and of course any orders that may have been uh, entered if the case had been filed. Uh, we, uh, of course, I want to uh, review in advance uh, those items uh, in advance of the case management conference so I can facilitate a meaningful discussion and, and refine uh, the issues. Uh, I also, in advance of the case management conference, will send a proposed case management order uh, and that case management order uh, serves as an agenda, and I believe we've attached to uh, this uh, webinar uh, a uh, case management order that you can use as a, a template. Uh, so the order itself, that is the proposed order, in a sense serves as the agenda uh, because it helps us work through the various issues such as the timing, 
uh, filing uh, the pleadings, of course, uh, dis discussing uh, discovery, what will be allowed, deadlines associated with that, uh, the discussion of uh, motions and dispositive motions in particular, and I'll, I'll discuss that uh, in a little more uh, detail later. Uh, we uh, also want to, of course, uh, discuss witnesses, uh, expert disclosure dates. Uh, this is really just uh, pretty much like a pretrial conference, uh, pretrial hearing, um, and uh, the pretrial order that will be entered uh, as a result. Uh, we need to determine a final hearing date, uh, the location, uh, discuss logistics such as you know, uh, whether uh, the parties should contain a court reporter, uh, whether an interpreter is going to be needed, whether the, there are any other special needs, uh, discuss the applicable, as Michelle was mentioning before, the applicable law, uh, the rules of procedure, uh, how uh, evidence is going to be considered, uh, and also to set a pre-final hearing status conference. I've already alluded to that, but that's very important uh, a week or so uh, before the final hearing to have that final conference. Uh, we also want to discuss at the case management conference pre-final hearing submissions. Uh, I'll discuss this in more detail uh, later as well, uh, but that is uh, uh, items that the parties will submit uh, to the arbitrator shortly before the final hearing. Uh, I also think it's important uh, to discuss uh, mediation uh, and are the parties agreeable to mediate? If so, uh, by when will that occur? Uh, also to discuss uh, the form of the award, and Michelle will discuss uh, this in, in a little bit uh, more detail uh, later as well, but whether it would be a, a simple award or a reasoned award. And uh, last but certainly not least, to discuss the uh, fees and the cost, uh, who's paying for them, uh, when any deposits uh, are going to be required, whether the deposits will become non-refundable at some point, all those sorts of things, uh, very important uh, to uh, to address that uh, up front, uh, and uh, if deposits are uh, to be required, then uh, to set a, a reasonable uh, time frame uh, for that. Um, so I, I will send out, as I say, a proposed case management order uh, and encourage the attorneys to discuss uh, all of these things in advance of the uh, case management conference. And then immediately following the case management conference, uh, and again, I think this is really the key to an elegant arbitration is the timeliness with which the arbitrator um, responds, uh, follows up after hearing. So I try as best I can to schedule these case management conferences on a day when immediately after I'll have time to summarize uh, the conference in detail. I'll send out an email. Uh, and then as soon as I can, if not that day, very shortly after, I will prepare a proposed case management order. I, I usually prepare it as a proposed stipulated case management order because hopefully uh, we've been able to talk through all of these issues and the parties uh, have agreed. So in, a sense, in that sense, it's actually a stipulated case management order. Uh, so I think if you have an arbitrator um, Again, who's good at moving the process along, that's who, who has some procedural experience, um, the, that the case management conference, having a candid discussion about the issues, uh, giving the parties, that is the attorneys, an opportunity to um, share uh, their honest observations about uh, the case um, and try to incorporate those things, those concerns into the case management order, uh, the timing, uh, are we going to allow enough timing for uh, or enough time for discovery and what have you, uh, that I think if the arbitrator uh, can facilitate a meaningful discussion, which is then captured in a stipulated case management order, my experience is the parties are, are more likely to comply with it and not be in a position of having to request that the case be continued. So uh, again, there's a kind of an art and science to everything in the law, as you know, and I, I think that, uh, uh, that there's a, the, definitely a component of that to conducting the case management conference and, and the uh, consequent order. So. All right, uh, so Larry will now share in greater detail how to craft that case management order to create an elegant arbitration. Yeah, I'm gonna be brief here because we need to move along. Um, the, preparing the case management order is where the elegance uh, is really created. This, this becomes the roadmap 
for the arbitration process and, and intelligent planning is critical. As Yogi Berra said, if you don't know where you're going, you're going to end up somewhere else. So, and, and I want to stress too, what Jeff said, we work hard. I want a stipulated arbitration case management order, uh, stipulated in the sense because we do regard this as a facilitated process, seeking the agreement and the consents of counsel. I like to call for, in the right cases, for the principal parties to also be present at the case management order so they can buy into or see the way that we're going to uh, set up and, and, and run this process. Definitely want buy-in, uh, and it's easy to agree to an overall process before these specific issues and specific problems come up. It's kind of a let's fix the roof when the sun is shining and, and, and get the job done. In the final analysis, though, when it comes down to defining the process, uh, the arbitrator makes the, the, the decisions. Um, the, this is where a good arbitrator will take control when it needs to take control and, and work it out. Another critical component of this process, uh, defining the, the roadmap, is a strong issue refinement process in the course of these discussions. Um, we want to get to the center of the case. Uh, the, we, Jeff mentioned we get the, all the complaints that have been filed and the responses that have been filed and that kind of thing, and we have all that verbiage. But there's usually just one or two principal issues in, in a case. And in the case management conference, and as we're preparing the case management order, uh, we want to, to work toward defining and agreeing on what that central issue is. And then you set the case management order to deal with that issue. Certainly, you're going to set an overall schedule everything from the statement of the claim to the final evidentiary hearing. And I would submit that that three months, you know, to eight months is probably an ideal time frame. I've been on arbitration panels that have lasted uh, years. Uh, I'm not sure they needed to, but, but three to eight months is the norm uh, from the beginning to the end. Um, as Michelle mentioned earlier, we're going to select and confirm the procedural and evidential rules if it's not already in your agreement. Um, we're going to devise and schedule an arbitration hearing program to fit the refined version of the case, to fit the center of the case. So when we're talking about identifying our primary fact witnesses, we just want the witnesses that are essential uh, to, the t to, the, to the issue in, at hand, the, the critical. You know, we're going to present their testimony live by written statement or by sworn depositions. Um, expert witnesses. I, we need to exert great control over experts that tend to come in and take over the process. So we're going to require expert reports anyway. Uh, we want us, their essential input on, on the issues. Um, I don't know that it'd be necessary to schedule them for live testimony if we're going to have their reports, uh, but, but let's talk about that. The identification of documents that we're going to be using, what are, what are the essential exhibits to be presented at the hearing, uh, and, and when are they going to come in, and, and what, what are they going to be? Uh, how do we have to get them and get, get exchanged and get them out there? AAA has a uh, preliminary hearing procedure rule P2 checklist that gives you, uh, gets into the weeds with a lot of things you ought to be talking about, but the, the theme here is Let's talk about what the center of the case is. Let's let's define. Let's refine the issue down to what really matters, and and focus everything on on putting that together. Now, one of the biggest challenges in that is setting a discovery process. So, let's go to discovery, Michelle. Thanks, Larry. And uh, I want to just pick up on another theme that we just discussed earlier in the presentation, which is arbitration is a creature of contract. As you listen to Jeff and as you listen to Larry talk about the things that need to be in that case management order and what that case management conference looks like, you see that we're primarily looking for agreement between the parties on that case management order. So again, it's an opportunity in essence to contract for the type of process that best fits the needs of your particular dispute. So let's keep in mind with respect to discovery though, that in its classic sense, it did not really have a place in arbitration. Um, in its classic sense, 
it was in litigation, but not in arbitration. Basically, all the effort and all the um, time and energy was centered around the hearing itself. And we still advocate that this is an appropriate way to pursue an arbitration in a base in a smaller case. In fact, I've arbitrated small paper disputes like Jeff mentioned in the beginning uh, that were strictly all decided on the paper. So in that particular instance, was there not only was it not only was there not discovery, um, there wasn't even a, a final hearing. It was just everything was submitted by affidavit and by paper and then as an arbitrator I made decision on the papers but obviously when we're dealing with complex cases that's not appropriate we know that we need some discovery in a complex case and um, so what we're going to do though is talk about some different ways to limit that discovery because the bottom line is if you treat arbitration the exact same way, if, if you as lawyers litigate arbitration the same way that you conduct yourself in the litigation process, you don't get the benefits of arbitration. It, it isn't a streamlined, cost-effective, efficient process. So now let's take a look at some ways that we can limit that discovery. And you can see back to the theme of it's a, it's a um, creature of contract, we're talking about agreed discovery procedures. So these are things that were discussed at the initial conference and basically agreed to by the lawyers. So consider limits to to all agreed discovery dis procedures. Basically, keep your mind wide open and consider limits with respect to all types of discovery. Consider instead of presenting a whole slew of witnesses to identify some of those witnesses that you're gonna present either by their deposition, either by affidavit, by written witness statements that are gonna be in lieu of testimony, again, Think about how we can streamline the process. I'm a big believer in the meet and confer because so many things can be agreed to between parties and between counsel that there's not, there really shouldn't be an issue with respect to discovery disputes. We should be able to resolve a number of them before we even get to having motions filed or having a hearing. So, Definitely when you are using a three arbitrator panel, you don't need to have the entire panel present for a hearing on discovery motions. Those are things that you can delegate to the chair. The chair is very qualified to make those decisions with respect to discovery disputes. And the bottom line is you shouldn't have too many discovery disputes in an arbitration anyway. You're gonna have that schedule that we talked about earlier in that case management order. There's going to be a document production and exchange, and that should be basically a full exchange of documents. You have to remember that as arbitrators, we're going to lean in favor of allowing evidence in and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna give the appropriate weight to that evidence. So you shouldn't be engaging in lengthy battles with your adversary, your opponent, on what documents are gonna be produced and what are not. In fact, more often than not, when Larry's arbitrated, when I've arbitrated, um, we have the, the lawyers submit us with one set of documents that the parties have already agreed will come into evidence. Um, there's, there's all kinds of ways to limit depositions and Larry's going to talk us, talk to us in detail about that. So I'm going to turn that over to him in just a couple of minutes. Requests for admissions, very rare. There's just really not much need for them. And interrogatories, we would suggest that you use them for purposes of ferreting out damages, but not really for determining liability issues. So I'm gonna go ahead now and turn it over to Larry to talk a little bit more about how to limit depositions in the arbitration process. 
Yeah, well, the depositions present a special challenge to an elegant arbitration process, and you, you need to start from the premise that uh, the American arbitration rules, matter of fact, I don't know any arbitration rules that that will allow depositions. They're usually not called for. There's no, no authorization for taking them. Uh, commercial Rule R22A in the AA authorizes an arbitrator to, quote, manage exchange of information, and it's been argued that that gives the arbitrator the power to uh, authorize or to direct parties to take deposition. Uh, composition, I mean, complex case rule uh, L3F allows depositions in acceptable cases. That's the only uh, reference to uh, to um, depositions in the in the arbitration rules, and those are exceptional cases that are part of the complex case uh, world, and those are only allowed at the arbitrator's discretion and upon good cause shown. So. The premises were not really going to be taking a lot of depositions, and as Michelle mentioned, the, the, the history, the background behind that was bring your witness to the hearing that, that you need, put him on, and we're going to deal with it right there at the hearing. Um, if, however, we're going to plan depositions, you definitely want to put some limiting strategies together uh, as, you're, as you're doing your case management conference. One strategy, uh, we're only going to do depositions upon good cause shown in the discretion of the arbitrator. So if you want one, let's file a motion about it. Let's discuss it with the arbitrator. Why are we taking this deposition and what do we want to get out of this, this deponent? Uh, another alternative would be to say, well, we're going to limit each side to three depositions or two depositions or five depositions. Another alternative to that is to say we're going to allow each side 10 hours of depositions. I don't care if you take 10 one-hour depositions or one 10-hour deposition, but we're going to allot 10 hours each for uh, deposition time. Um, I like to encourage the parties to use uh, uh, Rule 30b-6, a kind of a deposition notice, where you just say, look, I want to depose your witness, your employee, representative, or agent who has the most knowledge about the following facts. And, and uh, you, you pick him and bring him to me, and then that's what we're going to use to make that discovery. Um, experts, uh, under Rule 26, if you adopt the federal rules for your procedure, they're going to be required to file comprehensive written reports anyway. Um, those typically come in in lieu of depositions. We're going to have that data there. It's, it's very rare that we put on a a case involving experts without having the experts testify, so they're going to be there anyway. I question why it's really necessary in an arbitration environment to add the time and expense of taking depositions of experts prior to the hearing in, in any event. You got, the, you got the report, you know what they're going to say, and prepare your cross-examination of the points you want to raise uh, for, the, for the hearing. Uh, so uh, those are some of the ways you can kind of control the deposition uh, beast as it, as it comes up. Jeff, what about dispositive motions? Uh, I hear a lot about should we or should we not allow them in an elegant arbitration? Well, I guess it's, if the question is do they have a place uh, in arbitration, the, the short answer would be yes. Um, I, I say that because I've had at least uh, one arbitration, fairly significant matter, that ended uh, in my granting a motion for summary judgment. So. I don't know how um, the arbitrator um, would eliminate them uh, without somehow prejudging the issues, which of course you can't do. But Larry, getting back to what you were referring to getting to the heart of the matter, uh, I certainly think in that case management conference, you could have a candid discussion about the prospects of the parties filing dispositive motions. And in some cases, they'll readily acknowledge um, that they don't intend to do that. And, and certainly, I think the arbitrator can, su can suggest that, um, you know, if it's going to come down to, a, if depositions are going to be allowed and it's going to come down to a matter of reading deposition testimony and what have you, uh, you may question um, the, the attorneys about whether they uh, really would have a basis for moving for summary judgment uh, or otherwise file a dispositive motion. So uh, I don't want to say that as an arbitrator I would discourage it, I, I, but I certainly would question it uh, to make sure um, that each side has thought about it at, from the beginning uh, as soon as possible uh, about whether there's a realistic prospect of them getting out of the case on a, on a uh, motion. 
but but certainly I, they they do have a place. As I say, I've had at least one case where it, w it was ended with a granting of a motion for summary judgment. Uh, and and even uh, if that is not the case, that is the case doesn't end with the uh, the resolution of the dis the so-called dispositive motion. <clears throat> Other issues may be eliminated. I, I think it uh, often often is the case that the parties in leading up to uh, a motion may stipulate to certain issues um, and, and what have you. So you may come out of the hearing on the motion uh, with, with not only the arbitrator having a better understanding of what the actual dispute is, but the parties uh, as well, and, and perhaps even have, as I say, having uh, stipulated uh, to certain facts or perhaps legal, legal principles. Um, you know, the disadvantage of them uh, is obviously that they're expensive. Uh, to they take a lot of time uh, and effort, uh, which means money. Uh, and so, you know, part of an elegant arbitration uh, is to, to try to streamline the process as much as possible. So again, I think this is kind of a matter of nuance. Uh, I don't think, uh, I don't think the arbitrator, just as a judge wouldn't prejudge an issue, an arbitrator can't do that uh, either, but can certainly have a candid discussion with the attorneys about the realistic prospects of, of prevailing on a, on a motion for summary judgment. Um, I would also mention, uh, you were asking about dispositive motions, uh, and we've referred to the AAA uh, rules and their platform, uh, so some of our attendees may be familiar, but uh, at least I, I'm, I'm currently handling an arbitration involving the AAA, and, and in that, uh, case management order, um, I allowed for the filing of dispositive motions, but for non-dispositive motions, um, AAA has this procedure by which the party wanting to file a motion has to request permission by letter and then the other, and, and to include a good faith conference representation or certification, and then the other party can submit a, a, a responsive letter. Uh, so that's AAA's way of trying to uh, eliminate uh, unnecessary motions. Um, I would say my experience with that is somewhat mixed in that uh, the, the time uh, and effort associated with preparing and responding to the letters may be about what it is for the motion, the motion itself in some cases. Uh, and, and sometimes the parties just uh, don't seem to be aware of the provision and then they'll go ahead and submit a motion and then me as the arbitrator have to point out that they haven't complied with this letter requirement. So um, I, I, as I say, I've had sort of mixed results with that, but I, 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 it bears mentioning because it's acknowledging uh, the, the process of submitting letters is acknowledging that motions um, can uh, ultimately um, take a, a lot of time uh, that, that may uh, prove to have been unnecessary. Let me also talk about uh, pre-arbitration submittals or submissions. Uh, generally speaking, uh, and this has kind of been a, a, a recurring theme through this presentation this afternoon, is how we want the parties to agree on as much as possible. Uh, so uh, I ask the parties submit to submit, usually about a week before the final hearing, a joint statement of the case, a joint stipulated fact, agreed issues, a joint exhibit list, as Michelle mentioned, uh, providing uh, uh, the arbitrator uh, with the copies of the exhibits. I'm a little old school. I like to have a loose leaf notebook containing the joint exhibits and also the separate exhibits as well is helpful uh, because I will look through them the night before the, the uh, the arbitration just to familiarize myself kind of with the scope of what what is being uh, which what might be offered of course each side would submit um, a witness list uh, I'd ask the parties to provide legal authorities that are highlighted uh, that I can review uh, in advance uh, deposition excerpts need to be designated that is page in line uh, and I also give jump in real quickly here one one thing that can save a lot of time on the exhibits is uh, consider asking the parties to to balloon comments on the exhibits themselves. So you're given a 30-page AIA 201 contract. Um, there's really only one or two parts of it that they really really want to focus on, and and they want to make some comment, highlight it, and then put a balloon comment on it. These, it's and and this is what you want me to read, and and this is the 
the, the, the thought you want me to take away from the reading. Uh, the other side, of course, sees this and they can put counter balloons if they wish, but it, it sort of helps focus the arbitrator on the specific part of the document that, that uh, the parties want them to look at. Yeah, let me yeah. just add something um, briefly to that. If you look at the little illustration that we have on the slide, we've tried to illustrate the concept of ballooning there. So you can see that there was an email um, put into evidence from a CFO. Um, obviously, we um, there's financials that are below that that you can't see that are inside that envelope. But there was a you know, obviously that comment, please delete section four from the financials, and then you can see the little balloon we put next to it, evidence of intent. So that's really what we're trying to demonstrate here. Okay. Go ahead, Jeff. Yeah, thank you for those comments. Mm -hmm. uh, the other thing that is helpful is for the parties to submit a brief in advance. However, uh, I recognize that that can be very time consuming and expensive, so I don't necessarily insist on that. Uh, but uh, I provide the parties with the option uh, and, uh, of course, establish the timing, length, rebuttal, what have you, so that that process is fair. Uh, and also uh, something that I learned from my days on the bench and handling non-jury trials uh, in the civil division uh, is I found it very helpful uh, to have proposed final judgments, uh, if not uh, the first day of the uh, the trial, or in this case the arbitration, then at least by the last day, I, I find that a proposed award, not only does it help, I think, focus the parties, that is the attorneys, on what they're attempting to prove or disprove, uh, but uh, it helps me. It's like a roadmap as I'm, I'm uh, receiving uh, the evidence and, and entertaining the arguments. It helps me put all that in perspective. Now, having said that, uh, I uh, recently had a uh, arbitration where you know, one of the attorneys just said, judge, or uh, um, well, I think maybe she did say judge, but anyway, said to the arbitrator, uh, you know, this we just can't get this done for some some evident reasons and I said that's that's fine just get me something afterwards and so the, the parties did provide a proposed awards um, after uh, the uh, final day of the uh, arbitration but I, I do think that's a, a tip I, I uh, or a, a practice I uh, kind of employed when I was on the bench and I, I found it to be uh, uh, very uh, useful in arbitrations as well. All right, and uh, so we've been talking all this time about things leading up to the hearing, and now Larry is going to share some thoughts and strategies regarding the hearing itself. Okay. Uh, there's a lot of things you can do in the hearing procedure to cut down on time and to, to make the process elegant. Again, more planning, more specifically focused. I like to break down uh, – planning ahead of time on the order of proof and the presentations. What schedule are we going to give for the opening statements? What schedule are we going to give for uh, each of the witnesses as they come in? And, and the presentation, uh, whether by live testimony, by transcript, or by video, um, and, and what kind of direct, what, kind, what time frame do we want to exercise direct examination and cross-examination? One thing, particularly when you have three arbitrator panels involved, as you're scheduling your day during the hearing, um, allow time for arbitrator questions. Uh, and a lot of times arbitrators can can take take the whole process away from if you let them, but if everybody knows we're, we've got this to accomplish in the morning between nine and noon, and, and that's our time frame, we tend to, to focus on what's important. In that respect, a lot of arbitrators I see now are using a chess clock approach, basically, where counsel, you're given four hours on your side, you're given four hours on your side, and we got a chess clock working back and forth as, as uh, one side starts talking and, and, and using up their time. Um, when you have a reporter recording, it's a lot easier to record that time and keep track of it. And this is something, again, that the process-oriented arbitrator needs to be uh, tuned into as well. Um, a good idea, too, that we've used before that, that works is, is what we call hot tubbing the experts. And the normal course, what you do is the plaintiff puts on his case, he brings in his expert two days later, a day later, whatever it is. Defense shows up with their expert, and there's a direct examination at, at these separate times. Why not bring them both in on the same day? 
Um, plaintiff expert goes in first, gives his opinion, cross-examination, defense expert shows up, rebuts it, cross-examination, boom, we got all the experts out of the way in one day, and we're not dragging this process out. All the follow-up questions have been, have been uh, raised and answered. Uh, in the same context, uh, you might consider conducting your hearing in a manner where you've, you've broken down the testimony, direct and rebuttal, on an issue-by-issue -issue basis. I, I do a lot of construction, so I'm going to say you could do windows, balconies, and doors on one one morning, and then that afternoon we're going to deal with the roof, and then, and I mean the plaintiff side and the defense side is going to go on uh, on that subject, on that issue, uh, all together. And then we'll move on to the plaintiff and defense side on the roof problems all together. It, it focuses everything on, 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 the, on the essential issues in specific issue areas. Um, all evidence that necessarily um, needs to be sort of admitted. I, I'd really, it's, it's not much point in arguing evidential issues. So simplify admission process by formally admitting all joint exhibits into evidence at the beginning of the procedure. We've got joint exhibit numbers we're going to be referring to all the way through, uh, and you're going to preserve objections to relevancy and so forth as, as the evidence is discussed and, and brought in. Another key component that advocates should pay attention to in conducting the hearing, rehearse and perfect your graphic aids. Pre-test your PowerPoint programs, make sure your charts are all there, your exhibits, your telephone monitors or television monitors are working, speaker phones are hooked up, we know how to dial them and how to use them, the projectors are all aimed and focused. We don't want to waste time during the hearing when everybody's there and the clocks are ticking and, and, and the, the, the money's being spent, uh, we don't want to waste time in that environment trying to get equipment to function. Get all that done in advance. So, um, again, a clean, elegant, sharp, focused uh, hearing procedure. All right, so Michelle, we got the ev evidence in. The hearing's done. It's now up to the arbitrators. Talk to us a little bit about the form of the award. Okay, thanks, Larry. I want to just mention the hot tubbing. I really like that idea because, um, you know, ex expert testimony can be very complex, and I've actually served as a juror on a jury, five-day jury trial, in which there was a lot of expert testimony, and then, of course, I've served as an arbitrator where there's been expert testimony as well, but I think that would be extremely helpful to have the opportunity to hear one expert's testimony and then directly after that hear the other expert's testimony. So I really like that um, proposed technique of hot tubbing. So, so now let's take a look at um, the options that we have with respect to an award. And basically they're twofold. You know, you can have a reasoned award or you can have a simple award. Obviously a reasoned award is one in which the arbitrator or the panel sets forth findings of fact, conclusions of law, and then basically states the decision. It's more time consuming, thus it's more expensive, so what are some reasons that you might consider having a reasoned award? Well, you know, quite frankly, it gives the attorneys and the parties an opportunity to um, file a motion for reconsideration after the award is entered. If they think maybe the arbitrator really missed something that was very obvious, um, I'm not suggesting that there's necessarily some kind of written procedure for that for a motion for reconsideration, but um, it, is, it is a process that has evolved up through the judicial system. Um, something that was really interesting to me, and I had never considered it, because typically when we talk about arbitration, we talk about one of the benefits of arbitration is its finality and the fact that it is not appealable. Um, the process for setting aside arbitration awards is what we call vacator. You you move to vacate the, the award um, and there are some prescribed reasons for that but um, 
I have recently encountered arbitration agreements that actually provide for an appeal from the award of the arbitrator. So I find that very interesting and obviously I think that a reasoned award is going to be much more helpful if there's going to be a potential for an appeal. And then I think another reason would be it provides a company who perhaps utilizes arbitration provisions in their contracts, whether it's their employee employer contracts, whether it's their vendor contracts, whether they're a big company that does a lot of work with the ultimate consumer and it's in the consumer contract. Um, it will give that corporation the opportunity to basically have that dispute decided in a private forum and so that corporation can gain the wisdom of knowing how to alter or modify their business practices without having that particular dispute aired in the public forum. Um, also, I think that same rationale would apply to avoiding um, potential exposure later on. In other words, in, in the context of a private arbitration, that corporation could see how that particular dispute plays out and then alter things from the standpoint of their business practices to avoid liability in the future. So I think those are some of the reasons to have a reasoned award. And a simple award is simply one in which the arbitrator states the award or the decision I love Jeff's idea about having the attorneys provide a proposed draft of the award prior to the final hearing. I think that really focuses the arbitrator or the panel of arbitrators on, you know, what the issues are, um, what the parties agree to, what they don't agree to, and what they're proposing in terms of some kind of relief. Something that's really important too is if there's going to be an award of attorney's fees, it doesn't make sense to try that particular issue as part of the liability and damages picture. It makes much more sense for there to be an interim award entered by the arbitrator or by the panel and then deal with the question of attorney's fees by separate hearing prior to entering a final award. So those are really the um, suggestions I would have with respect to the award. And now Jeff is going to discuss some tools that might further assist you with respect to your arbitrations. Thanks, Michelle. And yes, uh, finally, if you'll if you see on this slide uh, in the middle there uh, is the stipulated uh, pre-arbitration case management order. That's really Larry's creation. I would say it's unofficially become the Upchurch, Watson, White, and Max uh, arbitration platform. I certainly have used it. I've modified it over the years and, and uh, will change it from uh, case to case to some extent. But that's that's the basic platform that I think most of us use here. But also, I want to draw your attention to the other documents. Um, compelling and staying arbitration in Florida and the other one put petition to appoint an arbitrator in Florida State Court. These are actually Westlaw documents, Westlaw's practical law series, which is proprietary to Westlaw. Um, but they had asked us, uh, by us, I mean Upchurch, Watson, White, and Max, and, and really, <laughs> candidly, John Upchurch, I think is who they first contacted, uh, to serve as sort of the resident experts in Florida on arbitration for Westlaw. Uh, and so, uh, we drafted um, this article, Compelling and Staying Arbitration in Florida, uh, which is a practice note explaining how to request judicial assistance in Florida state court to compel or stay arbitration uh, and describes what issues counsel must consider before seeking judicial assistance and explains the steps that you must take to obtain a, a court order compelling or staying arbitration in Florida. 
uh, I had ended up kind of taking the lead on that um, article, and and so uh, I guess it was about a year later they asked that I, if I would draft this petition to appoint an arbitrator in Florida State Court, and so that's the other document, uh, which is an interactive document that you can use for for you know drafting your petition. Um, these are available, as I say, they're proprietary to Westlaw, but if you Google or do an internet search for either of these titles, it will come up to Westlaw, and you can actually, uh, I did it this morning just to make sure it still works, um, there's a free trial available, so you can review them, and there's no credit card required, and, and we don't <laughs> we don't get a cut of that, Upchurch is not a part of that, we don't have any uh, uh, commission, uh, but I would commend them to you, I, I have to say, they're not, they're not bad, and that's not being immodest, uh, uh, Westlaw, of course, uh, uh, <laughs> played a role in uh, drafting of these documents as well. So I would, I would very much commend them to you. They're, they're, uh, they're very, very useful. So, all right, with that, Michelle, you want to take us home? Sure, sure. Larry and Jeff, thank you so much for uh, your input today. And I certainly want to thank all our attendees for joining us. We hope that you gain some additional insight into the world of arbitration. Please feel free to reach out to any of the three of us by phone or email if you have any questions. And I want to go now to the all-important Florida Bar course number. So this is something for which you can receive CLE credits, General 1.5 and Civil Trial Certification 1.5. And the Florida Bar course number is 1906483N. I'm going to repeat that, 1906483N, as in Nancy. And um, we have come to the conclusion. I just have a couple more things I want to add. Please mark your calendar and keep your eyes peeled for additional webinars from Upchurch Watson. Those will be on October 23rd. Crafting the Effective Mediation Summary, a workshop. That's That'll be near and dear to all of our mediators, right? And then November 20th, Mediating Franchise Disputes. So October 3rd, 23rd and November 20th. And I again, I want to thank, thank you for your time today and hope that you did gain some very important insights to the arbitration process. Thanks again. <laughs>